Hi, welcome back to Sky Gazing. This is your host, Gayatri Jairaman. In today's episode, I wanted to do a reflection on Sumana Roy's How I Became a Tree. It's a book I've sat with over many years since it was first published, and I thought it was also apt because of um, the fact that the American edition has just been published today in a uh, Hearty congratulations to Sumana for that. But also because I've been reading it in consonance with two other books that I feel become the sort of markers for it on either side. And I'll explain what I mean by that. The first is Herman Hesse's uh, Seasons of the Soul, which is a collection of poetry. And of course, we also know his Uh, much excerpted and uh, often cited uh, translation of his essay uh, in uh, the book Baum Betrachtungen und Gedeicht which a lot of people sort of mistake uh, as a book that was written by Hermann Hesse actually it's a collection, a compendium of German essays on the tree of which Hermann Hesse is, is one Um, I haven't been able to source the others uh, and also I don't speak German as you may have guessed from that atrocious sort of uh, attempt um, but the reason why I turn to Hess is because at least for me I find Herman Hess the original mystic of the West and in his sort of in the seasons of the soul also he contemplates trees, nature The other book that I wanted to make a deliberate um, juxtaposition to is Peter Wallerman in The Hidden Life of Trees, What They Feel, How They Communicate, Discoveries from a Secret World. And uh, the reason I chose this is because it's at the other end, it's, it's a scientific, or it claims to be based on scientific fact, though it doesn't explain it to that detail. Um, it isn't a science textbook, but it uses science as the base. And what I find is that uh, Sumana Roy, in her book, manages to position herself between these two markers of a mysticism that is essentially observation coming from Herman Hess and an engagement with the tree that is essentially scientific coming from Peter Wallerman. And she is in a space and uh, where she takes these two essentially divergent strands and forms this sort of creeper, this vine that goes around the tree. And that is an essential act of mysticism in itself, the structuring of that. It might become a little more clear if I read you first a poem from uh, Hess and then we'll go to Sumana's observation technique. This poem from Seasons of the Soul is called Autumn Takes Hold of My Life. Autumn rain has drenched the grey forest. A brisk morning breeze blows through the valley. The chestnuts crack hard, tumbling from the trees. They burst open, moist, brown, as if full of joy. Autumn takes hold of my life. Gales split and tear my leaves. My branches are shaken. Did I bear fruit? My flowers of love bear the fruit of suffering. My flowers of faith bear the fruit of hate. The wind rattles my brittle branches, but I laugh. I still stand strong in the, ro- in the storm. What do I care about bearing fruit, about achieving goals? I blossomed and flowers were my purpose. Now I'm wilting and nothing but wilting is my aim. Hearts don't beat for distant goals. God lives in me, God dies in me, God suffers in my soul. That is enough purpose. Right or wrong, flower or fruit, nothing but names, 
it is all the same. A brisk morning breeze blows through the valley. The chestnuts crack hard, tumbling from the trees. They burst open. I too break open, burnished with joy. Nature was has his first and foremost teacher, and this is a you know sort of claim that Sumna also makes in her book, uh, the association of nature to the student, and, and uh, he says an appreciation of a devotion to a never tiring observation and contemplation of natural life inspired has his writing on every page. Yes, indeed, and you can see that. You can see how deeply he associates with it. But essentially, Hesse's observation is distant. It is aloof. It is the work of a devotee who speaks of and to something that is higher than himself. And uh, this is something that's very apparent in the translated excerpt from the essay. I'll read that to you as well. For me, trees have always been the most penetrating preachers. I revere them when they live in tribes and families and forests and groves. And even more, I revere them when they stand alone. They are like lonely persons, not like hermits who have stolen a way out of some weakness, but like great solitary men like Beethoven and Nietzsche. In the highest boughs the world rustles, their roots rest in infinity, but they do not lose themselves there. They struggle with all the force of their lives for one thing only, to fulfill themselves according to their own laws, to build up their own form, to represent themselves. Nothing is holier, nothing is more exemplary than a beautiful strong tree. When a tree is cut down and reveals its naked death wound to the sun, one can read its whole history in the luminous inscribed disc of its trunk. In the rings of its ears, its scars, all the struggle, all the suffering, all the sickness, all the happiness and prosperity stand truly written. The narrow years and the luxurious years, the attacks withstood, the storms endured. And every young farm boy knows that the hardest and noblest wood has the narrowest strings, that high on the mountains and in continuing danger, the most indestructible, the strongest, the ideal trees grow. So you can see essentially Hess's stance towards the tree is worshipful. He finds strength, he finds solace, perhaps to some extent he also finds identity. He is attuned to it, but he is attuned to it in the way that people approach a deity, a force they don't exactly understand. Which is why I find the um, other marker of Peter Walvin also extremely useful. Because what he does is he approaches trees at a very cognitive level with an essence of understanding. He seeks to know the tree. And to know a tree, you have to look at it at a very tangible plane. And he does something that Sumna also does in the book, which is, he says there's not just life and secrets in the hidden layers of the tree above the ground, there's also beneath the ground. And beneath the ground is this complex interweb um, of literally a network of roots, almost holding hands. And when Peter Wallabin wrote that book, he came from a German scientific background. So the researchers and scientists essentially already know that there is hidden life, there is hidden activity in, the, in these cells that we call plants, trees, seeds, saplings. There is activity, there is communication. And this is backed by evidence and research. The difference that Peter made over there was he made the cognitive emotional he made it something that gives you a sense of awe in the way that people gasp when they realize that elephants are sentient, have emotions, connect, communicate, care, remember. 
Peter did that for the scientific body of research around trees. And where why it stands on the other end of the spectrum from Hess is that Hess made the cognition of the tree extremely mystical, extremely worshipful, coming from the same environment. Though quarter of three quarters of a century earlier. But essentially, when you read Sumna, you realize that as much as Hess is a devotee, he's a distant devotee. In uh, Indian philosophical terms, that would be he still is in the space of Dvaita, differentiation. And in philosophical terms, the highest value that you can accord a worship, the pinnacle that you can take it to is oneness. Whether it is in Vajrayana, the Bado Thadol of the Tibetans, where your meditations and chants take you to merging with the deity and becoming the deity, identification is unification or to the Indian philosophical systems where the separation disappears this is what Sumana does she takes the mysticism, the observation the science the tangible existence of the tree the sound, the breath the feel, the bark the outer, the inner, the above the lower, the visible the invisible And she merges them. And she becomes this creeper that wraps itself with all this knowledge around the tree until she formulates this larger picture and has wrapped herself entirely to the point of complete consummation. And in a sense, that is what this book also does to you. I realize I haven't yet read from Sumana's book and we're a fair way into the podcast. But I felt this lead up was necessary to understand that that is how this book must be read. It is not a factual book, though it has fact. It also contains an almost living bibliography of engagement with the concept of trees within it from Nandalal Bose to the more contemporary thinkers and writers. But this is a book that grows like a tree would grow from a seed within you. It has to be implanted. You have to give it space and time and patience and energy for it to grow. You have to give it the sunlight. When we read the poem from Hess where he contemplates himself as a tree. Right? I said there was a little bit of distance and let me read an excerpt and, and from um, how I became a tree to show you how that distance is bridged. And I also think that this one thing that this points to is also that Hess considers the tree from a very male point of view. And I'm not trying to imply that that is a wrong perspective or an incorrect gaze. It is that when it is a male gaze, it essentially seems to divest itself of a lot of pain of a lot of complexity and move directly to the subtle. Whereas Sumna arrives at the subtle by sifting through a lot of that pain, a lot of that complexity. For instance, in her chapter, The Woman as Tree, 
right she speaks about woman with a head of roses frida kalo the bengali writer balai chand mukhopadhyay greek mythology uh, the story of daphne and apollo the fear of sexual violence that forces women into identification or pushes them into identification with the tree as a safe space and then she tells you the story in the one collected by the poet and translator ak ramanujan A stubborn and adamant younger daughter is killed by an angry father because of her refusal to get married. After her body is chopped into pieces and buried in the garden, she emerges as a beautiful pomegranate tree and plays the loveliest music on her veena. Indra, the king of gods, is utterly charmed, and they eventually get married. Not all women to tree stories ended with such lone happiness. She quips. she goes on very few understand that much of my ambition need to become a tree was located in the weaknesses of my body when questioned i searched for examples sometimes i told them about vansh pradeep singh a ruler of the kingdom of savar in northern india in the early 20th century If you cut the smallest branch of a tree it is just as if you cut my finger he is said to have told his subjects Ellison Banks finally writing about the plant as person equivalence in her book Plant Lives Borderline Beings and in Indian Traditions quotes from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad As is a mighty tree so indeed is a man Thus a person's hair are the tree's leaves and his skin the outer bark and when blood flows from skin it is as sap flowing from a tree's bark for when a man is wounded blood flows as sap from a tree that is struck struck a person's flesh is the tree's inner bark his nerves tough like the tree's inner fibers his bones the wood inside and his marrow the interior pith she also quotes this branch of verse from ramanujan speaking of shiva the root is the mouth of the tree pour water there at the bottom and look it sprouts green at the top i sometimes wonder why so many leaves are heart shaped in poems or moments as short lived as poems themselves i have seen the heart move walk the entire being turned into this organ that controls life when i chance upon heart shaped leaves and there are too many to name from the beetle leaf to the raspberry I have the sense of my insides turned out for me to see. And I'll allow you to read that uh on your own. But that is the essential difference that I needed to point out to you. That the worshipful male gaze of Hess as mystic though he is also deeply attuned to indian mysticism to the teachings of the buddha to the philosophies to the upanishads is still the devotee to the deity and this is also the stance of peter wallaby he takes on the gaze essentially of the um observer the scientist the researcher he's a little clinical even in his emotionality but we shouldn't be concerned about trees purely for material reasons he says we should also care about them because of the little puzzles and wonders they present us with under the canopy of the trees daily dramas and moving love stories are played out Here's the last remaining piece of nature right on our doorstep where adventures are to be experienced and secrets discovered and who knows perhaps one day the language of trees will eventually be deciphered giving us the raw material for further amazing stories until then when you take your next walk in the forest give free rein to your imagination in many cases what you imagine is not so far removed from reality after all 
and he speaks about the need to allow forests to grow old to see their beauty of living breathing coping surviving staying connected um, the sort of uh, interdependent ecosystem that they create around themselves and they nurture and it's all beautiful and peter's magic is that he weaves this essential beauty in um, into the science almost like a sculptor breathing that life into you know the clay and the mud and and the shape and the form that it takes peter achieves that which is why his book is magical in its own way but what sumana does is this interspersion of the science the fact the physicality and she pulls that urge from you whether you're approaching this from the point of view of the scientist and the researcher or whether you are approaching it from the point of view of the devotee the lover someone who enjoys spending time in nature even meditatively contemplatively reflectively she forces in a kind of almost nuclear fusion this merging of the mystical and the worldly in a torrent flow of sentences words our feelings emotions but also cognition where are you standing she's asking you are you in the tree yet and that is why you can't read this book like words you have to read it like a river and you can't read a river from the bank you have to enter into it you have to be swept off your feet by its torrent you have to flow with it i love this little line that she throws in my husband after he chuckled at my weird nomenclature said that he'd found the plant life equivalent of my voice too i have the voice of daner khedidhu the wind waves on paddy fields and in that sentence is so much love the so much intimacy the so much knowing of oneself of the other the so much relationship the so much of a life captured in a few words and in this way as she says a little later hal ball and stirring words often came to my rescue knowing trees i understand the meaning of patience knowing grass i can appreciate persistence this is the kind of journey that she weaves what happens when i turn into a tree am i able to walk in a sense what she's saying is is what practitioners mystic seekers sort of come to this paradoxical question of existence in their lives because what happens once you've seen a higher truth when you've participated it when you've merged with it even for a fraction of a second this is exactly what created arjuna's dilemma on the battlefield he said hang on a minute you know there are two truths here and if you're telling me and if i can see that the larger truth is valid i don't know how to exist in this lower reality where the killing becomes necessary where the fighting becomes necessary where the battling becomes necessary and that is exactly what happens that's the exact that's the entire basis of madhyamika as a philosophy right why are there these two truths why is there absolute why is there relative and then how do you exist if nothing is real if everything is suffering and everything is not suffering in the sense of the way that is translated but if everything is impermanent and transient and why does it make a difference what i say or do and 
And then once I've seen that, how do I act? Who am I? And then it can very easily tug you into this nihilistic whirlpool of not knowing. Sumana comes to that point where she says, how will I work if I become a tree? So while a lot of poets and writers including the ones that she she sort of uh, nods to in her journey each one takes a different lens in considering the tree whether it is the lens of the artist the lens of the seeker the lens of the um, mystic the devotee uh, the scientist the um, you know it, it, the researcher each one's lens is Uh, inquiring but the reason why sumana's is more urgent is that is because she brings it to the point of existential crisis she reaches the pinnacle of that all important question which is what do i do i have brought my worship to this point of identification and if there is the point of merging how do i separate and is there a point and yet i must live and this is a dilemma because if we are we are part of nature we are nature we are manifestations of nature and yet we must use nature and utilize it and consume it and that perpetuates a life cycle of greed it makes us want to abhor the way in which we are nature and so there are so many questions do i worship do i distance myself do i participate and shrug away the collateral damage that that is going to produce and she does this very this contemplation very beautifully when she comes to the bear tree what was it about bear trees shorn and leafless that had attracted my eye pathetic fallacy being one of my great vices i tried to spot whether this visual attraction for the lifeless had anything to do with my itinerant melancholic urges the human equivalent of the bare trees many of them dead but still standing with borrowed dignity would be skeletons a diet of ghost stories most of them from the house help for the most part immigrants from bangladesh who seemed quite bent on revealing the scariness of their former country had shaped my natural timidity into a morbid fear of ghosts i would never understand why humans without flesh and skin that was after all the only difference between ghosts and living bodies should scare me It was difficult for me to imagine myself photographing a ghost or human corpses but I had spent hours which over time ended up to months and then years moving around dead trees looking for the perfect angle that would capture the beauty of their branches actually the beauty of the geometry of a dead body This beauty of bareness I began to see later as the beauty of barrenness see the beauty of a desert for in being shorn of flowers and leaves these trees had managed to escape the burden and technology of reproduction these postmenopausal trees gradually grew into statues in my eyes and with that thought came the question why are there no statues of trees how and why had the visual culture of humans neglected the transformation of nature into culture when it came to trees and she goes into how a child sees a tree and how we impose this view of the tree the notions of treeness that we inherit that we pass on for instance the complete indifference to the roots how to draw them because they are invisible and how she sort of searches for a teacher and finds one eventually 
इन नंदलाल बोसे जैसे When I would many years later read trees of Shanti Niketan during a long stay in Shanti Niketan I'd begin to look at the old trees in a strange way In my gaze would always be the question how my Nandalal Bose have looked at them A few things about Nandalal Bose's life must be mentioned here Born in Bihar in the late 19th century Bose was a student of Abhinandranath Tagore master teacher and nephew of Rabindranath Tagore who prevailed upon him to teach at his university in Shantiniketan Nandalal's best loved work his portraits of village life are now considered among the most remarkable modernist paintings in India Almost completely by chance I landed upon Nandalal's essays on drawing trees The artist and critic KG Subramaniam had translated Bose's essays into English for a volume published by the Vishwa Bharati Publishing Department. I had looked for it in many libraries but it wasn't to be found. So when the proprietor of Subarna Rekha, a bookstore close to Rabindra Bhavan, handed me a copy on a dark park at evening in March, it was as if I had at last discovered a long-lost relative. Needless to say, I spent that night without sleep. Nandalal's magical and even mysterious formula for making paint from plant products would come later. But before that I had to find out what he thought of trees. In these curiosities I found myself behaving like a lover. I was eager for some kind of kinship. Lovers are after all relatives in a shared universe, and there is such happiness, even relief, in loving a loved one for the same reasons. A tree grows upward. It is driven by a singular urge to spread towards the sky, trunk, branch and leaf. This is the opening line of the chapter, the structure and characteristics of plants and trees. In it is empathy and identification. Yes, it holds the ambition of the tree to defy gra- gravity and grow upward. The painter Nandalal had already become a tree by the time he came to writing this for both the tree and the painter are clients of light chlorophyll and canvas both are functions and consequences of light light the tree's food the painter's kitchen and so nandalal's concern is only with the visible tree roots do not interest him because they are not creatures of light what follows next is more evidence of the greed for light All its branches and all the leaves and flowers on its twigs and stems grow in such a way as to get as much sunlight as possible. This is why its branches, its twigs, flowers and fruits emerge in a spiral motion from the parent trunk, branch or twig respectively. To absorb as much as possible the rays of the sun, its life giver with all its body, then grow big and bear fruit is its natural urge. there can be no doubt that nandalal is speaking as a tree i recognized my ancestry in love immediately i'll stop there because this is essentially what sumnaroy also does for you the reader for me definitely she leads you to this ancestry of light she traces the genealogy of where your belongingness to the natural world comes from she deconstructs the tree for you the sound of the tree its voice its patterns its urges its purpose its existence its dilemmas and as in the verse from the brihadaranyaka the merging with the tree becomes a mystical source of identification that at the end uplifts you to a space of worship not of another but if used correctly of yourself and that is why this is a book that is essential reading for those of you who are in a quest for the mystical for the sacred i'm going to stop here
I highly recommend you pick up Thorman Hess's work as well as Peter Wallabin's. This pursuit of the mystical does not exist in isolation. It exists and expresses itself on a physical plane, on an emotional plane, on a mystical and spiritual plane. And books like these which channel all these forces into one are great tools of spiritual unification. I hope you really enjoyed listening to this reflection. I hope it serves a purpose and please do pick up Subna Roy's How I Became a Tree wherever in the world you are. I believe the American edition has just been put out today. And do join me for the next edition of Sky Casing. I'll see you soon.